All right, I will start with this case. Um, I will start with the recent CT and I'll give you the history, which is in summary form. The patient that was diagnosed with myeloma hemorrhoidosis in 2013 has been treated with a lot since then, the most recent being the most recent including a stem cell transplant in May and June of 2019. So here, what I'll do is I want to go to actually the Okay, this one. And I'm first just going to scroll through this top to bottom rather quickly, having given you the clinical context. I'm not giving you all the clinical information, but I'll just scroll through that. And if you were going to read the CT, what might you say? Let me go make it big and I'll go through it one more time from the bottom up and yes I am scrolling through it rather quickly now what I want to do is I want to bring up alongside it an exam from May of last year so let me put that there and let me put this one here. I'm going to try it. I hope this will work. But let me just try to do this a second. What I want to do is I want to sync them. So let's go like that. And I hope this is going to. Okay. So again, the timing is that. So the previous on the left. And that didn't quite sync like I wanted to. So let me try and scroll through the first, the one from last year. And then I will. Come back to the one that's the more recent one and scroll through them at least in the lower lung zones. So here we go. Let me see if I have, I want to bring in the thin cuts here and I want to bring in the thin cuts here. That's odd. That's really odd. Okay, what have I done wrong? I've done some kind of fusion, haven't I? That's not good. I can't figure out what I did there. Okay, this will have to suffice. So on the right-hand side, sorry about that, is 2019. And the recent is on the left side. And this is a situation in which when you have a comparison, some findings become apparent when you look side to side and pay particular attention to the overall lung volume. And this one is obviously a little bit more mag than that one. But let me stop here in the lower lung zones and compare it with the prior. And I hope you can appreciate that we have a pattern of mosaic attenuation here 
in the lower lung zones, I'll try to bring that out. But the areas of low attenuation dominate. So these are big and black lungs. And as I scroll through, there may be some areas like that. But let me try and bring that out a little bit more in the lower lung zones on the most recent one. Yeah, I hope you can appreciate there are some areas that are relatively white. So we have mosaic attenuation, but dominantly black. And if you look at the caliber and bronchial walls, they are a little bit thicker. And some of the bronchi are perhaps a little bit more dilated now compared to before. So what's also revealing here, now I'm gonna show you the expiration series. So we do them not in the volumetric mode on all our scanners, we may be switching over, but there is expiration. Here is expiration. And here is expiration. And I hope you can appreciate that in the time that this person was allowed to breathe out by the technologist before the image was acquired was relatively short, like take a deep breath in, blow it out, and then they press the button and they scan the patient. So for example, if you look at that, you'll see the airways are still kind of open. And if you look at that, you'll see the posterior membrane is not forward. So there are two things to think of in a general sense. One is, this is just a matter of a patient being unable to cooperate or the technologist uh, not doing it properly, or is the patient really trying to expire, but in the time allowed, is not able to expel air. So this finding here is very significant and it's one that you can easily go by. You might write this off as just an inadequate attempt at expiration. So again, we have findings here then and here of very substantial abnormality, in particular constrictive bronchiolitis after stem cell transplantation. And I will show you comparison of PFTs that would indicate that back in 2017, there was mild obstruction, but now in September of this year, we have very severe obstruction on PFTs. And here's sort of a trend line going from 2013, and you can see a substantial decrement in these parameters, some related to obstruction between April of 2019 and now. So this can be something that is potential, you can go right by this if you're not sort of attuned to what to look for. Jeff and David, have you seen cases like that? Yes, uh, indeed, this is this is pretty profound. It tends to be worse in the lung bases as in your case here from graft versus host disease. Um, so, and then the, the bronchiectasis is, is a late finding. So initially you'll have Sometimes you even find small airway shadows um, as reflecting in a, in a case of bronchiolitis. Then you'll have air trapping, and then it usually takes a year or so to get bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is a late finding. Like that, right. Yeah. yeah. This is very dramatic, and it's diffuse and severe air trapping. Hence, we don't have, we mostly just have black lungs. There's so much air trapping. Yeah, we, we, we had a case recently, and it, it, it's, I think, to the um, less experienced eye, you can walk right over it um, because the lungs look so clear almost, but it, the subtle yeah. mosaic attenuation can be helpful. And, of course, expiratory yeah. images. Um, I like to look at the trachea because sometimes the only thing you see is flattening of the wall and maybe a slight decrease in volume. But otherwise, with the severity of air trapping, since most of the lung is abnormal, it, it doesn't look like your typical expiration. Right. And oftentimes the patient in the time allotted can even get to the plateau. So the plateau is the concept that typically a normal person will expel most of the volume in one second and then get to a plateau. If you look at the curve in patients with this severe obstruction, that curve just goes slowly up from trying to expel air and it never gets to a plateau and there's no curve. So this is severe airflow obstruction. Okay. This one is just 
interesting from a particular point of view. So let's say we've talked about this before, but I'll show this because it's a nice example. This initially is not a CTPA, which I'll show you subsequently. But if you are going to read an example of pulmonary embolism and you looked at this, you would say, well, there's not much contrast medium in the pulmonary artery. If we measure the Hounsfield unit here, it's a mean of 130. And typically we go more than that, of course. But we've mentioned before that there isn't a magic number. So let's image this patient, even though this is not a CTPA for PE. And in spite of that, you will see that we can see pulmonary emboli. So here, and you will see it here, and you'll see it there. So even with this degree of contrast or pacification, one can diagnose PE. I mean, we don't aim for this low, but it, it is a nice example of the fact that you can't see that. So let me stop there and let me just get a feel for how attenuating this is, drawing this, the plot that is. So that is a mean of 16, which is interesting, with a standard deviation of 19. But just a nice example of that you can't, um, in a sense, write this off for P and stop looking. And what's also nice about this case is that if you weren't attuned to that right off the bat, but then you began to saw, see other things like these, like this, and then I'll show you that in the mediastinal window, the findings still are very typical of areas of peripheral pulmonary hemorrhage and or hemorrhagic infarction. So if you didn't know the clock right off the bat, but thought about that possibly, and you go back and you say there ought to be P. Oh, yeah, there it is. Right there. Like that. So just a nice example of that. Here is a case which I think is very interesting. I don't have pathologic proof, but I'm pretty confident otherwise that I know what's going on. So let me show you first this CT in a patient with a history of a bladder cancer. And the interesting finding is, on this scan, is this opacity. Let me see, I should go back to something a little bit. 840, this one. So everything looks fine until you get to here. And you say, oh, that's curious. There is this opacity in the anterior basal segment of right lower lobe. It's not homogeneously opaque, it's more attenuating there, sort of solid looking, but more brown glass attenuating there. And then in here, a little bit more superiorly, you wonder about the pulmonary vessels in there. So I'm gonna leave that just there for a moment and I'm gonna show you a follow-up, which I'll bring alongside. So here we have August and here we have October. Now when you look at that, we'll see that that has become rather solid. And if you didn't have that, of course you would describe that in a different way. Now what I want to do is I'm going to bring up a CT, the earliest one that I have, and that is from, and I may have some cuts from July. Okay. So this of course is going to be looking through the retrospectoscope at that area. So here we have again, July and August. And this is really subtle, but if you look at the vessels just in that area, right here, and you just compare the caliber of these vessels, these lobular vessels, with ones adjacent to it or elsewhere in the lungs, in retrospect, these are distended. So what I believe is going on here is that we have intravascular metastases, they are located in lobular arteries. They are growing over time and they are producing sufficient ischemia to produce an infarct in that location. And some evidence for progressive metastasis is the presence of new nodules in the lungs 
in locations such as that. And I found another one in the right lower lung posteriorly here. So we've seen so-called vascular treating bud, not rarely, but I think that this is a vascular treating bud type of phenomenon, but sufficient to produce infarction of like two lobules, perhaps, up there. And I've seen that maybe two or three times in my career. Has, so so Howard, yeah, I've seen, with, you mean with an infarction? I don't think I've ever seen one with an infarction before. Yeah. This is either the second or third case that I have. Wow. Now, I don't have pathologic proof for e any of them, but the findings I find very compelling for I that. Absolutely agree. Has anyone else ever seen infarcts from endovascular metastases? Yeah, I, I have. Okay. But yeah. very distal and very small. Yeah, I think this is a really nice example of that. This one is, um, I've got a category of cases that I've shown before at this conference of what I call hidden lesions. And um, I'm, you know, in the context of, I've been practicing radiology for a long time and occasionally I'm asked to render an opinion on the presence of a lesion, sometimes in a medical legal context, when there is potentially the assertion that failure to perceive represents a breach of the standard of care. And I've shown cases before um, to illustrate this, and that's absolutely not the case. And when I teach my residents, I say, don't grow up to be a radiologist at some point in the future where you potentially make outrageous statements about failure to perceive something as a breach of the standard of care. So here's a case I saw recently um, after some imaging was done. So let me bring that up. This is February and I'll bring up the funnel projection from June alongside it and give you some time to look at that. Both exams were reported as normal here at our institution. And I'll bring up the lateral projection from February and I'll come back to the funnel from February and June, which is that. Let me go back to here. This is not really meant to be eye testing in that absolute sense, but anyone confident that they can see a lesion and where it's located. Let me bring up the CT that was done subsequently. So I'll bring up the coronal dimension to show you that the opacity of the atelectatic lung is not small. So it's all in here. And there isn't just a little bit, there's a lot. And just by virtue of its appearance, its location, and its morphology, I think we can all understand why it may escape detection by any observer. And just as a matter of interest, here is the offending lesion, here partly protruding into the airway, which is, as you would anticipate, a carcinoid, benign carcinoid. But again, just appreciate how much opacity can be located here very difficult, impossible to perceive. Any general comments from colleagues, you guys? Uh, Howard, can you go back to the lateral again? Okay, that's right there. I want to see how much, of a, how much of a spine Maybe. sign there is. Here, and then I will bring up the SAG. So I'll take the SAG from the CT here. And here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to decide if there was more collapse with the patient supine on the CT table or if, if it's just, and it's hard on a small screen, but I mean, you could see some irregularity on the frontal view. I would expect more of a spine sign given the amount of collapse you're showing. But um, not necessarily. Yeah. 
you know, there's air rated lung here, there's the opacity there, is an air rated lung there. True. I think I think uh, Jeff, it's overlapping the posterior aspect of the spine more than the vertebral bodies themselves. So it's not as apparent as if it were just a little bit more anterior, we'd Got see it. more of a spine. Okay. The, the right, the right bronch, sorry, the left main bronchus is being dragged downward by this. So that that was one hint on the frontal view is that the it's left bronchus is too mm -hmm. vertical. Yeah, there's some very subtle findings here that you were going to teach signs of low bar atelectasis or atelectasis related to left main bronchus. Yeah, the, other, other the, iron, the, other the other indirect sign, I'm sorry, the other indirect sign is that the descending aorta is obscured. Right here. Yeah, again, I think we all agree that if you're reading the stack of radiographs, you can understand why it's hard to perceive that and easier to perceive, of course, when you know exactly where to look. And I knew exactly where to look because I saw the CT. The ironic thing about lower lobe collapse is the worse it is, the harder, harder it is to see. Yeah, the more volume loss. And as you then perceive the other findings of low bar atelectasis, like depression of the hilum and the vascular findings, et cetera, which we teach in the context of signs of obstructive low bioelectrosis. So I tell my, my, my residents and so on, be humble. And when you get older, be humble. All right, those are mine, Jeff. All right. Sorry, that was PAX. I'm sorry. No problem. I was like, there's no patient. I changed it on this, so there's no patient. OK. I think I've shown a, a lot of these. and that look like sarcomas where you have a sausage shine. Um, but this one's interesting. So, you know, I saw this initially, and I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a sarcoma. Uh, the strange thing about it is that usually the sarcomas that have a proximal sausage, the distal vessel is also expanded, whereas this is kind of contracted down. Um, and this is where just having prior studies help. So here's the patient back uh, about a year before and clearly has acute PE. And I've now seen this about four or five times where I'll show you the sequence of events. So she has acute PE, um, it, it doesn't completely resolve and then she develops occlusion, persistent occlusion of, so this is now three months later where she has persistent occlusion of the lingular vessels as well as the left lower lobe. And then this will contract down and what happens is the clot then kind of just starts, I don't know if it's blood goes in there and because the distal portion is occluded, it just propagates, but it, it forms this propagation that looks like a sausage. So looking at the, which I, again, I always equated with sarcoma, um, but this is now, I saw this and I'm like, well, put her on anticoagulation, see what happens with this. And then this is a few months after she was put on anticoagulation and you can see that most of that sausage had disappeared, and now it looks more like kind of classic CTEF. So this was a, um, I guess, a, a sausage fool out uh, where the kind of what I thought would be a really pathognomonic sign for sarcoma just turned out to be clot propagating onto a distally occluded vessel. And I've now seen this about three times. Um, and the clue I've seen, again, is that the distal vessel, in most cases, sarcoma continues to expand. Um, but uh, I don't know, just a, a nice a nice case, I thought. Um, let me pull this off to just make sure that the all the patient information, okay, the patient information remains hidden. So this is, a, I haven't seen many cases of this. Um, and I don't know, I'll tell you the diagnosis she's given clinically and what I think she has. She has common variable in immunodeficiency and has had this worsening fibrosis with a lot of septal thickening and nodular septal thickening. Um, you know, and I don't know anyone off the bat, again, these weird kind of bizarre looking nodules, uh, septal thickening. So is the spleen big? Yeah. yeah. Glilled. glilled huh? Yeah. So I, I so I thought this would yeah this, I thought this would be glilled or glilled or glilled or whatever granul what is it granulocytic lymphocytic interstitial uh what is it granulocyte yep. 
granulocyte uh, lymphocytic interstitial lung disease or something. Granulomatous um, lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. Thank you. Granuloglial. That's why that's easier to say. Thank you. And that's what this was on biopsy. I hadn't seen many cases. This is, I think, the first and only case I've ever prospectively called. Um, but uh, yeah, just a cool case of something. I don't know. I, I, I've seen some that are more nodular and not as fibrotic, but I don't have much to add to that beyond that it's an yeah, interesting the, case. The most severe one I've seen imaging wise. And we actually have imaging over for many years and it, it starts out more nodular and then gets more fibrotic over about five years, um, which is interesting. And then- Seth, was, there, was there lymphadenopathy before you leave this case? We just don't look that in. Yeah, quite a bit. So that's part of the sarcoid look to this process. Oh, is it like a sarcoid-like reaction? Is that why? It has it has a lot of similarities to sarcoid, except it tends to be basal predominant. But it look, you know, it's a it's an interstitial process in the bases, but they often have lymphadenopathy. It looks like sarcoid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the lung biopsy, sometimes the granulomatous component dominates, that is the non-necrotizing granulomas. In some patients, the lymphocytic component, the LIP-like reaction or the follicular bronchiolitis dominates. And you can't tell from the radiograph what's going to dominate because it's so extensive with findings of fibrosis, yeah. Yeah, I have to look at the biopsy. They just, I just saw the final report and they said findings, given the history, consistent with gliold. Um, okay. You know, this looks like some of the LIP cases I've, I'm, I've seen. So that was one of the things that crossed my mind when this first went up, except it's more extensive. And does, so you I mean without, but without the history of CVID, this doesn't look like your typical LIP um, or lo what we think of follicular bronchiolitis LIP. Uh, I, 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 have, I have seen LIP look like this. You have? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I have except this is more extensive. Yeah. But it's usually basal predominant again. Which this one is, I mean, it's more severe in the, in right. the older studies, it's almost all in the lower lobes. I should get the progression, it's kind of interesting. I just didn't have time to anonymize it, but it started at almost all in the lower lobes and they just extended superiorly over the years. Great case. Uh, let me, and this is my, that's gonna take a while to load. I, I think this is just a, Freaking cool case, and it, it and it took me a while to realize why it was so cool. Um, so uh, this is a heterotaxy polysplenia, bilateral left sidedness, situs inversus, bilateral hip arterial bronchi, blah 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 blah, dextrocardia, kind of a double outlet right ventricle. But that's not what's interesting. What what's interesting here is the way they because this patient has two IV uh, two SVCs. And so the way they fix this patient, and as it gets continuation of the IVC, like most a lot of these patients do, the way they fix this patient because of the dual IVCs and the as it's continuation was they decided to do um, two kind of separate blends in a fontan on the left. So basically what they did is they took the hepatic venous outflow, which is always there, did an extra cardiac fontan and put that into the basically the junction of the left-sided SVC. So left-sided SVC, left fontan draining the liver, basically go into the left lung. And I, let me go to the arterial phase to confirm that basically all of the right-sided SVC blood goes into the right lung and all the left SVC blood for the most part, which there's none here yet because it's too early. I mean, there's a little bit of cross contamination, but almost all on the left goes to the left. So point being is that all the hepatic blood goes to the left and on the right side, you have this azagous continuation up here. That's kind of through this little, I don't can't remember if it's called a Kawashima. I can't remember what the hell they call this thing where they kind of take the azagous, hook it into the SVC through it, but they, they create a graft here and that dumps into the RPA. So basically what the art what's feeding the right pulmonary circulation is all the uh, systemic venous blood that's not from the liver and from the right side of the head, neck, whatever. Okay, now, now to the cool part. So the cool part is, is we know, or at least I now know, 
that um, what people think is a cause for hepatopulmonary syndrome and the development of all these microscopic AVMs is this lack of whatever hepatic factor, special, special juice that's in the liver that prevents the development of arterial venous malformations. So you have to imagine that if you look on the left, the left looks pretty normal. You don't see any AVMs. Remember, all the liver is draining to the left. The right, on the other hand, if you look, there's these AVMs all over the place, including some big ones. And if you look out, there's all these large AVMs. So presumably, this patient has developed all these large AVMs on the right and not the left because all the hepatic factors and special hepatic stuff is going only to the left lung and not to the right. Oh my goodness. Isn't that cool? Oh my goodness. That is wow. so cool. <clears throat> that is stunning. The that's what I'm sitting down. Too. But they're everywhere. They're everywhere on the right. They're huge. I mean, we've seen a lot of we see a lot of Fontans, and we see people with Fontans with liver injury, and a, and we see hepatopulmonary syndrome, and I've never seen macroscopic AVMs. And um, but this is a really kind of neat example of, and I and one of my I'd say one of my younger colleagues kind of pointed it out to me. I thought it. I thought I had to do with blood flow alterations and other stuff. And he said, no, dude, it's because the liver's going all to the left. And I'm like, oh, you're right. And um, so anyways, I, I thought that was a really, really neat case. Very much so. Wow. All right. Those are, those are my <laughs> All right. So that's a tough one to beat. <laughs> okay. Brian or David? Let me. I can show one. All right. All right. Do you guys see my screen yet? We do. Not yet. Oh. Okay. You guys can see it. Excellent. Um. So this is a three-year-old who came in uh, with uh, concern for glomerulonephritis. Uh, you can see that on the chest radiograph a very large heart. Uh, and they got an echo. Uh, and the echo is concerning for uh, coronary artery stenosis, so they got a, a coronary CTA. Uh, the coronaries looked fine on the CTA, but uh, as we come down, we see uh, this filling defect in the apex of the left ventricle, um, so this uh, thrombus here. And then, uh, sorry? Brian, so we're just seeing the face radiograph. Sorry, say that again? We're just seeing the face radiograph. Oh. Um, HPT, just a big chest, big heart on chest x ray. Okay, let me try, try it again. Okay, what about now? Can you guys see a CT image now? Yeah. Okay, and can you see four, four images now? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so uh, the, the coronaries looked fine. I guess uh, on Echo, if they see continuous flow on Doppler in the coronaries, they're worried about coronary osteosinosis. Um, and to the the best of the abilities of a, a coronary CTA and the kid this small, the, the osteo, osteo looked fine. Um, but then the, you see this thrombus here in the LV apex. And then if you, uh, if you follow the aorta as you come down, so if you watch it here, it's kind of normal caliber. And then as you get towards the diaphragm, it just kind of flanges out um, and gets bigger there. Um, and it's a little irregular also along the side. Uh, so this is 80 kV, so don't get a, a very good soft tissue resolution with the stuff adjacent to it. But I kind of wondered, um, it looked like here was probably the, the right hemidiaphragm cruise. And so maybe there was some kind of intervening soft tissue between the aorta um, and the right hemidiaphragm cruise. Um, when reconstructed, that kind of looked like, like this. And you can see um, it's kind of this lumpy, bumpy appearance of the aorta. Uh, at the level of the diaphragm. Uh, so I told them that I was worried that this was a, some kind of aneurysm um, and uh, probably uh, going to be uh, like a pseudo aneurysm more so because it's a, uh, so lumpy bumpy. And so they got a, a, a abdominal CTA uh, about six days later. And uh, you can see here, um, eccentric non-calcified plaque, uh, very irregular shape, kind of like cauliflower or mushroom shaped. 
um, uh, lots of areas of, of both dilatation and stenosis. Here's the celiac uh, access origin, which is a uh, mostly completely occluded. Um, same thing with the SMA uh, high grade there. Um, and then uh, the the thing that was actually uh, probably affecting her worse clinically was that she was uh, having severe uh, hypertension and it was thought likely related to uh, what this is, which is renal artery stenosis. Um, you can see there's a lot of calcified, uh, sorry, a lot of non-calcified plaque present within the the right renal um, and then the left renal artery also. You can't actually see the left renal artery um, very well at all. Um, and then there's an accessory left renal artery, which also looks diseased at its, at its osteum, but not as bad. Um, so she went to the cath lab and they were able to open up everything except for the left superior renal artery um, with, with just balloon angioplasty. Um, and the, the reason I'm showing this image, so this is a repeat CTA and this, this CT compared to this CT is uh, 20 times the resolution. Um, so this is a 1.25 millimeter uh, axial slice thickness with a 512 by 512 matrix. And this is a 0 0.25 millimeter with a 1024 by 1024 uh, uh, matrix. Um, and because we used a smaller collimation and uh, a lower KV, um, this was actually for a CTA cap was actually a little bit less than half the dose of this abdomen and pelvis. Uh, CT alone, um, and the nice thing is when you when you when you get the higher resolution images, you went from having uh, maybe one or two images where you can see that left superior renal artery to now um, about ten images where you can see that the the left renal artery is is right here, the left superior renal artery, um, and it's it's patent uh, kind of towards the. The, the left renal hilum um, with this short segment stenosis. Uh, this one, this kid, we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on, but the, the leading hypothesis is uh, Takiasus, uh, even though she um, uh, has negative inflammatory markers currently. Um, and you can see a, a, a large uh, IMA with a arc of real uh, present as well back there. Was the aortic valve normal? Uh, good question. Uh, I believe so on echo. Didn't get a great look out on CT. Uh, were you thinking like a mid aortic syndrome? Like a Williams syndrome or something. Um, I mean, our whole aorta is just diminutive. The whole thing is just tiny. Yeah, I thought the the thoracic aorta was was pretty normal in caliber. Was um, Sorry, I wasn't. Was the thoracic aorta normal? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that, that was my first question when I saw this. Is like, could this be the result of a coarctation? Um, uh, but uh, but no. And then uh, it it. Let me see if I can show the. No, I just was sorry. I was kind of zoned out of looking at someone else. But you're right. Okay. The, the chest, those, the belly looks so the ear looks so narrow like that. Oh yeah. Well, that's not Williams. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, that, that's a, a, one of the questions that one of our interventional cardiologists had. He thought it, he thought it might be like more of like a, a, a stenosis rather than um, uh, an aortitis problem, um, and something like mid aortic syndrome. Um, you know. But to my eye, this looks more like a pseudo aneurysm than a true aneurysm of the of yeah, the no, upper abdominal aorta. No, that's not good. That's a pseudo aneurysm. Yeah. Um, so uh, interesting case. We're still still trying to figure it out exactly, but. Uh, uh, presumed tachyosis in a three-year-old. Cool. Thank you. Hmm? All righty. I think that's everybody. But Oh, Peter, you're here. Yep. I'm just listening in. Um, okay, so, I can go. That, that kid didn't have COVID by any chance, did he? I totally no. at all. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, we've seen some pretty... Uh, Submitted to the radiology cardiothoracic some very interesting vascular post uh, COVID vasculitides in young kids. Interesting, but, but that heart is totally jacked up too, right? What's up with the yeah, left yeah? Yeah, so the, the 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 is biventricular dilatation with reduced systolic function, uh, and I kept asking them, I was like, hey, can we do it? You know, we should do it a cardiac MRI at some point. Um, the troponins were negative. Um, uh, they were the cardiologists were saying, uh, telling me that they think it's mostly uh, going to be uh, just related to the severe pulmonary, uh, the severe systemic hypertension. Um, let's see, where's the? Uh, I finally they did get a they did get a PET. It's kind of not the best uh, quality PET ever. Um, and I asked them to do kind of a sarcoid prep uh, for the PET, uh, which they half did. Um, so you can see there's there's uptake in the LV um, on the on the PET, but Hard to know what to make of that because she she had not she had still been consuming carbohydrates prior to the pet. 
Okay. Well, thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have three quick cases I can show. Um, this was kind of a fun case. So this is a patient who had a double lung transplant. Let's see. You can see my screen, right? Okay. Had a double lung transplant, had a somewhat prolonged um, post-operative course with some acute graft failure or primary graft failure, but overall did fine. Transplant was done for uh, lung fibrosis related to scleroderma. And uh, on this exam here, you'll notice the graphs look pretty good. There's some pleural thickening, uh, but there's a funny appearance of the bowel. There's some what looks like extra lucency sort of in the upper abdomen, and uh, let me pull up the lateral at that time. And if I make it bigger, you can see just some funny looking lucency around the bell. So uh, went on eventually to have an abdominal radiograph a couple days later, and you can see she does have a, gastro a gastrojejunostomy for feeding. It has all this extensive, what looks like pneumatosis, uh, was having really no symptoms. So they did a uh, abdominal CT, and um, we can see, I'll change on to, whoops, sorry, on lung windows. You can see this extremely extensive pneumatosis in the bowel wall. And on the coronal, same thing. Uh, continued to have no symptoms. Surgery, saw her, and just monitored her and opted to do nothing. So this is an example of benign pneumatosis. And this can occur with many things, but uh, it's been reported in scleroderma. They can also get benign pneumoperitoneum. Uh, they can get motility issues with scleroderma, the so-called hidebound appearance of the small bowel, which was described on some of the um, older um, sm small bowel series literature. But uh, so not all pneumatosis is bad. Not all pneumoperitoneum is bad. Um, with no, you know, with a lung transplant, of course, you're immunosuppressed. You'd have to worry about an occult infection, but everything pointed to a benign etiology and it went away but just kind of an interesting thing to see on some of these routine uh re we get a lot of these when they come to clinic so got to always pay attention to the upper abdomen as well this is a cool case and uh, i'll be curious what you guys think of this so this patient has a known history of fibromuscular dysplasia and um has uh key. Uh, renal artery involvement, which I'll show in a second as we get there. There we go. And just a really nice example um, of the beating you see along the renal arteries. And then also, a patient also has some esophageal varices. And so on this abdominal CT, they saw this um, funny little vessel coming up into the chest. We'll get there in a second. So you see all these varices. And then right here, you have this filling vessel that seems to be heading north. And that's as, I think they only saw it. That's about as far as they saw it. So they asked for a chest CT to get a better sense of what was going on with this. And so you can see we got a good um, both left and right phase contrast pacification at this point. So we've got dense contrast in the pulmonary veins, left heart, as well as in the um, there we go the um, the right the pulmonary arteries as well and We'll see that vessel right here. So I'll, sorry, it's scrolling slowly, but we see that it, it comes up right into where the inferior pulmonary vein is and probably joins in a branch of it right there and then joins out here in the lung. So we've seen varices go to the pulmonary uh, uh, veins before. So I think that's what this is. And it's interesting, it makes you, um, None of the other varices are filling, but we're very early phase. So it's probably going uh, from north to south. And uh, especially with the patient supine, full inspiration, um, alteration of pressure in the chest, because on an outs uh, earlier evaluation, it looked like it, there was flow, because uh, there's thought to be an artery, but I think it's all venous uh, collateral, I'm sorry, venous uh, avarix is going down there. We're just catching it because it's filling from the left, from the right inferior pulmonary vein branch and heading south. I was curious what you guys think of that. I just don't find an artery, that is an artery, if it were shunt, it should be a lot bigger given the size of the vessel. And we just don't see what looks like shunting.
Hmm. I'll take it you agree with me then. Well, you know, Jeff, Jeff, I'm a little surprised that it doesn't seem to fill from below if it's varices with blood flow heading north. So could it be heading retrograde from that? That's what I think is happening. I think it's filling. I think it's heading from north to south. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And I don't think it's an artery. I think it's a varix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But yes, we have seen a stop to a varix. Was was varices draining to the inferior left pulmonary vein? But I thought that was in in that setting we had we had a lot of filling of the varices from the abdomen. Right. I think it was I think in that setting it was heading north. Correct. I think this one is heading south because it's the same phase as the as the vein this way, as the uh, the cardiac um sorry, the pulmonary vein here. Oh, okay. And then this is this is quite striking. So this patient um came here for potential lung transplant evaluation. Um, she developed COVID back in July and had ARDS. And this was her CT uh, in August or so about that time. And you can see she's got pretty extensive fibrosis. Um, there's traction, bronchiectasis, reticulation, volume loss, a little bit of sparing of the bases here. So maybe some residual acute resolving acute lung injury, but was pretty pretty short of breath at the time. And then with just in the course of about 30 days, you can see she's on a non-rebreather at this time, her lungs turned to this. Severe, severe fibrosis, uh, sure. requiring a lot of oxygen, even at rest. So this is just, I mean, I've this is one of the fastest progressing fibrosis I've seen, other than maybe some of the dermatomyositis ones associated with anti-MDA5, but uh, going from to this in just 30 days is quite impressive. Um, and it's presumably, it's just, it's all, she had no underlying disease before. Oh, where's that little one that breaks in the middle? There we go. Not in sync. Um, anyway, um, there we go. Um, she had no underlying lung disease before, as far as I know. Uh, so this wasn't an exacerbation, but you know, most of the time that organizing lung injury gets better, you might be left with some scar. But at this point, even afterwards, uh, she progressed to pretty, really severe lung fibrosis. So I, that's the first one I've seen from COVID so far. I mean, we've seen other causes of acute lung injury, but this one's pretty bad. Yeah, so when you recover from the acute illness and then you progress to fibrosis, that's very odd. I'm not sure. I don't I understand yeah. that. I mean, this scan here, you sometimes can, some of this stuff can clear. Right? We, sometimes this bronchial dilation is transient. It's not truly traction bronchiectasis. But to me, this looks like end stage lung honeycombing like holes here. So I don't think there's any recovery from this. So, so she was ac- acutely ill in the hospital between the two scans, correct? Um, well, she she was acutely ill before this, developed full-blown ARDS. This was sort of, as far as I know, this was after she was extubated and sort of um, kind of sent to a rehab. And then she got short of breath in the rehab. So I don't know if this is some secondary. Yeah, does she have an acute, like a second acute lung injury on top of it? I mean, that's kind of a weird, usually I, it should yeah, stop. You think it would. And she may have, I don't know. Uh, like I said, she had no underlying lung disease as far as I could gather. And it's definitely more anterior, which you see with a lot of, right? Does is it, is it look more anterior on the most recent one yeah, as well? Go. It's kind of off the screen a little yeah, bit. Sorry, let me fix it. There we go. Yeah, I mean, look at this. It's up. It's up yeah, there. which and then kind of common you see with the post DAD stuff. That I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty yeah, nasty. It's pretty bad. <laughs> more more collagen she had the lung injury and then she just fibrosed it she just added collagen to it and squeezed her lungs down we i have a patient who looks just like this yeah post with bilateral you know first right and then left pneumothorax very hard to treat scrunchy lungs just scarring everywhere 
but like most ARDS, as Seth was pointing out, the post-ARDS lung fibrosis is usually uh, upper lung predominant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. kind of makes you wonder if this is someone who would have benefited, I mean, I don't know, would have benefited from some high-dose steroids. May not, who knows. Yeah, one can even speculate that you know, in patients with acute lung injury on a ventilator and clinical ARDS, oftentimes the dependent lung zones when you're recumbent are adelectatic mm -hmm. and are protected from the ventilator so that if there's a component of ventilation associated DAD just from the ventilator, it could predominantly affect the anterior lungs. If, for example, she had been recumbent right. most of the time or all the time. Yeah. And that That's may be some of the, re the reason they, they, they rotate in between supine and prone. Yeah, so you don't really know. But, but yeah. Yeah. In, yeah, oftentimes the uh, dependent lung regions, the posterior lung regions in clinical ARDS are adelectatic and are spared from the ventilator. Yeah. To your point here, you see the relative uninvolvement of that dependent lung on the sagittal. Oh. This is the um, yeah this this is the this is the earlier scan, but even then. The, most of the injury was here. I'll make a sagittal of this one. Yeah, see that relative sparing down there. All right, well, that is all I have. Yeah, that's really interesting. Sometimes um, the intensivists, uh, acute care physicians, refer to the anterior lungs in the patient with ARDS that is aerated and ventilated as the baby lung of ARDS mm -hmm. because the posterior lungs are adelectatic and opaque, which sometimes some people call the sponge lung. But that distribution of lung aeration when the patient is supine is, is kind of expected in patients with acute lung injury, ARDS. So one can speculate about this in part in that, in that regard. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'll talk to you again next week. Okay. Right, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Too. Bye bye.